Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let's get started. Um, my name is Remy Shergill, um, and I, um, I work with the Climate and Health Alliance. I'm their campaign and comms officer. Um, if you could update your name um, to reflect um, uh, what your name and where you work and your pronouns, if you're comfortable, um, and feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, letting us know, you know, what you've come along for today and also what country you're calling in from, if you know it. Um, I'm calling in today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to um, acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd like to acknowledge that today I'm calling in from land that has never been ceded. Um, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, at the Climate and Health Alliance, we recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work and acknowledge that sovereignty of this land has never been ceded. Uh, and we commit to listening and learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on how we can better reflect Indigenous ways of being and knowing in our work. Um, and I'd like to welcome and pay special respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. Um, thank you so much everyone for, for being here. Um, I just want to thank as well uh, the groups who have made today possible. So this training has been organised by the Southern Melbourne, uh, the Southern Metropolitan Region of Melbourne, um, three primary care partnerships in this region. So in Live in Victoria, the Frankston Mornington Peninsula, Primary Care Partnership and the Southern Melbourne, Southern Melbourne Primary Care Partnership. Uh, PCPs play a really important role in bringing people together and in building um, capacity. Um, and that's a great fit for our work at the Climate and Health Alliance. We were really excited when we were approached to run this workshop. Um, and yeah, so a massive thanks to everyone who made this happen at these organisations. Um, a little bit about us, um, so I work for the Climate and Health Alliance, we represent over 70 health organisations in Australia, plus individuals um, who work together as a coalition to achieve, um, achieve the commitments and, and progress towards climate action, focusing on um, the benefits to health. Um, we want to create a powerful health sector movement for climate action and sustainable healthcare. Um, a little bit on me, um, I've worked in climate communications for six years, both in science communications and advocacy work. Um, my academic background is um, largely scientific, uh, sort of in the human biology realm and the environmental science realm, but all my work has been in communications. So um, I, really, I love talking um, about climate change and the best ways to talk about it. And I especially love working with health professionals because uh, you're considered a trusted source. Um, you are trusted messengers in society. People really trust what it is you have to say. And that's why it makes you such powerful messages on climate change. Um, so I would really um, encourage you all to introduce yourself in the chat, um, say a little bit about why you're here, um, what land you're calling in from today, um, and what maybe what you're hoping to get out of this. Um, so really quickly running through the agenda, uh, we're gonna cover why we're doing this, um, uh, back it up with some data and then spend a bit of time, you know, talking about how to talk about climate change. Um, and then you will be um, going into rooms to practice. I know a lot of you uh, are probably hate it. I know it can be really, it feels a bit awkward going into uh, breakout rooms with people you don't know but with people who have done this work before, um, the feedback that we get is this is really the most useful part um, of the process. Um, it, it's easy to think that we know how to do these things in our head, but when we try and say it out loud, um, it doesn't come out quite the way we think. So that would be, you know, uh, please don't leave before then. Um, the most useful thing is to go through that process. Uh, we'll come back together and reflect on what worked um, and what didn't. Um, and we can get advice from other people um, in the room about, um, you know, how maybe they would have handled some of the problems that, you know, you had and have a bit of a discussion. Um, and then 
I've got a few next steps for people who want to know more um, and to get involved. Just making sure that people can see my slides um, and, and that's all. I've got two screens and I'm not used to this setup. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, sorry, just letting a few more people in. Fantastic. So um, I'm going to start us here. Every major public health victory of the last century has had effective communication at its heart. Um, this is a quote from a climate health communicator that I really respect, Dr. Ed Maybach. He's um, over in the States. Um, and as health professionals, I'm sure that you're aware that communication is one of the most powerful tools that we have in our tool belt. Um, this statement is very true when it comes to uh, there's plenty of examples of um, communication being crucial for public health outcomes you know campaigns to reduce the widespread use of mercury uh, campaigns against big tobacco uh, health professionals were crucial in campaigns to say close in waste incineration around the world and uh, the very crisis we find ourselves in today uh, I think everyone can see the real world effects of um, Good communication, saving lives and protecting people uh, during a pandemic and also not so good communication uh, endangers them and, and sends people the wrong message and, and uh, it really affects people uh, with real consequences. So this is something, this is no different when it comes to climate change. Climate change has been called the biggest health challenge of this century by the World Health Organization um, and by the Lancet Countdown in 2009. Um, so it's no exception. We need to communicate about this properly in order to get the results we want. The problem is that people have been communicating about it really badly for about 30 years. Um, and there's a lot to um, unpack. Uh, the way we talk about it and the way we've seen it talked about is usually pretty unhelpful and divisive about a really complex issue. Um, so how do we talk about it? Well, the evidence says um, that simple messages repeated often by trusted voices are most effective. The good news is that as health professionals um, or people who work in health, um, the health sector, you are the trusted voice. Um, you know, every year in Australia, the top most trusted professions are usually people in the health sector. Um, this year, doctors and nurses came in spots one and two. Um, and even if you're not someone who people maybe see as that, you know, that traditional role as a health professional, like a doctor or a nurse, whether you're a health promotion practitioner, or a public health professional, um, whatever your role might be, um, people trust people who work in the health sector. So even if your role isn't in that, um, that, that very traditional list that comes out every year, um, people are taught that professionals who advocate for better health outcomes don't have an agenda, are evidence-based people and are trustworthy. <laughs> um, when it comes to simple messages repeated often, um, we know that uh, this works and we've probably heard it used for more evil than good. Um, this is something that politicians use all the time. They have a simple message, they repeat it often, it gets stuck in people's head and at least, um, at least you know, a, a sizable portion of people start to believe it's true because they hear it all the time everywhere. So um, we can use this, this power for good instead of evil um, and we'll talk a little bit about how soon. Um, Sorry, two screens, I get confused. So as I said, you guys are the trusted messengers and, and health professionals are more trusted than ever after the pandemic. We're seeing um, more health messages and advice on our screens than ever before. And it's very powerful because um, health is a persuasive frame. It's a, a, a persuasive way to talk about climate change and it appeals to people across the political spectrum. Um, so whether you're talking to people who you know are on board with, you know, climate science and they're quite active in this space or people who you think maybe don't see it as relevant to them, health is a really strong way to make sure that people see it as something that affects them rather than something that's a distant threat. Um, so we 
Um, I'm just going to go a little bit into the data that exists um, around this concept because while health professionals are really suited to this work, we wanted to understand if health professionals are doing this work, whether they feel comfortable doing this work, what they need to help them feel comfortable to do this work. Um, and uh, so we ran a survey. It's the biggest survey that's been done in Australia on climate and health. Um, we surveyed 875 health professionals from um, the five women the details of that survey. Um, so we had um, people from all states and territories, um, apologies, the, the breakdown of where they lived um, is pretty accurate, uh, uh, pretty um, commensurate with how people in Australia, the breakdown of where they live. Um, we did have a heavy skew towards female workers, um, likely because there's also a heavy skew towards female workers in the healthcare workforce. Um, and we have people across a broad range of um, age groups. Um, I did want to flag this, um, the breakdown of the health professions, because I know that um, many people here identify more strongly with public health or health promotion. So I do want to flag that um, if some things in this aren't aligned with your um, experience, it could be heavily influenced by what happens in a more medical sphere. Um, but, but yeah, feel free to put any comments in the chat as we go about things that you find interesting or things that um, align with your experiences. So um, we wanted to know if health professionals are concerned about climate change. The answer are, is that they are. Um, they're much more concerned than the general population. Um, about 50, over 50% of people are considered alarmed. These are people who are quite literate when it comes to climate change and also think that it will affect their lives personally. Um, whereas in the general population, this is just under a quarter of people would consider themselves like this. So uh, yeah, we are a, 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 um, a concerned group and this means that we um, can be mobilized to take action. Um, just flagging here, uh, the people who were most concerned with, the uh, sorry, the most alarmed with medical students, that aligns with a lot of data that we have. But yeah, public health and health promotion were very, um, alarmed and concerned compared to the nurses and doctors. And that really um, is reflected in the amount that they see these things in their workplace. Um, public health professionals and health promotion see them a lot more often. Um, so what are they seeing? So we're seeing a lot of people presenting with signs of heat stress, um, respiratory illness from pollution, mental illness due to climate change, distress, um, and climate fires, um, pollen-related allergies, um, but there's a whole range of them in there. Um, we're, some, it's not just the people presenting um, to our clinics or, you know, to our um, workshops or whatever space we work in. It's not just the people coming there with problems. It's also um, how it's affecting the workplace itself. So whether it's staff being absent from work due to the impacts of climate change or power failures, disrupted access to health services, um, the, the way that climate change affects our health sector in Australia is, is diverse and um, has some serious implications. Um, but we are a group that wants action. So 86% agree that climate change requires serious action. Um, I think that the health sector should be involved in, in getting this work. We wanted to know if people wanted to talk about it and if they weren't, what was stopping them? The most, um, the most reported um, barrier to talking about climate change was that they didn't feel, feel well enough informed, um, followed by lack of organisational um, support um, and, you know, not feeling like it's in their uh, remit as a health professional. 30% of people are talking to their patients about it. And, and as we're a group that's um, where over 50% alarmed and over 25% concerned, we are a group that can move from this 30% of health, prof, uh, health professionals talking to the people they work with about it to a much higher number. Um, 
health, the health professional survey said that they were much more likely to do this work if they were given the right resources and training. Um, and they also wanted to hear about climate change from sources that they trusted more. So at the moment, they're largely hearing about it from the news, um, though they are quite diligent in going also to check out journal articles. Um, but they want to hear about it more from departments of health and from their professional organisations and from their unions and from groups like primary care partnerships. So if you're with um, one of the primary care partnerships today and you feel like you're not hearing enough about climate change from them, um, I, I would strongly encourage you to let them know. Um, though, uh, by organising this training, I would say it's something that's definitely um, in their ballpark. I have just received um, a question asking where this survey data is from. So this is a survey that we ran after the um, session, I'm very happy to send uh, the full report to everyone here. Right, so um, that is sort of the, the best data that we have available for us in Australia. Um, it's not perfect, but it is a really good thing to help guide us under, to understand um, what people want and need in terms of um, support to talk about climate change and health. Um, and I'm just going to launch a poll here um, so that we can get an idea of what people here, what barriers they face in terms of um, talking about climate change and what sort of resources would help them the most um, to start to do this work more. Um, these are multiple choice. So if you feel like um, more than one applies, feel free to pick a couple. Um, and then just submit your answers. While I'm waiting for the answers to come in, I will um, just address any questions that are in the chat. Some of them are being sent privately to me. Feel free to put them um, publicly in case um, there are other people who um, might be able to answer your questions. Um, in terms of uh, simple messages repeated often, I have got a question about um, if this would cut, if this would work in a healthcare setting, um, because you know the things that we're trying to communicate are quite complicated. It's a really good question, and we'll talk about that shortly. Um, we will go through some quite specific tips on how to talk. Just gonna, I've almost got everyone um, submitted the survey. So um, if the last 10 people or so could submit, that would be great. I'll just give you 10 more seconds. Three, two, one. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, everyone. That's going to be really useful for us to um, follow up with and help understand how we can um, how we can support you to do that. Um, and just want to say thank you to Georgia. Um, she has just shared um, the media release, which um, covers where the how, the survey and when it was released. So if you are interested in more. Um, information you can check that out um, but I will send the report afterwards as well. Um, okay so let's get into some tips about how to talk about climate change and health. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of people who I think do it really well. These are some quick videos. Um, I want to flag that these people are presenting in the media. I wanted to get some examples of people talking to clients or community groups about climate and health but um, these tend to be either confidential or um, it just hasn't been enough demand for people to actually film them doing these things. So if you look up um, climate and health and, and people talking about it, it's largely TED Talks, which is, um, you know, people who are very articulate and often quite intimidating to emulate. But um, I am going to show you two. Oh, this video doesn't exist. Let's try that next. 
Okay, the next one exists. I apologise. I was going to show you a video of Greg Mullins, who's the ex fire chief for New South Wales. Um, he's an excellent communicator. Many of you would have seen him during the Black Summer bushfires, um, but we will survive without him. Um, we're going to watch this video of Dr. Kate Charlesworth. She is a public health doctor, and this is a clip of her talking on Sky News. Um, it's very short and sweet, um, which is different to what you might be doing in your day-to-day -day work. But what would be great is if you could watch it and um, just write in the chat anything you think she does well um, that makes the topic of climate change accessible to her audience. Can you hear that? Anna. No. Okay, great. Sorry, just need to share my, my sound. Health professionals and medical groups are urging the federal and state governments to act on what they're describing as a public health emergency caused by bushfire smoke. In a joint statement signed by 22 organisations, Sydney's poor air quality has been labelled an emergency which requires urgent action. Air pollution from the bushfires has blanketed parts of Sydney and New South Wales for weeks. Climate change is a health emergency. Emergency is not a term that we use lightly, but there is overwhelming evidence now that climate change is a health emergency. We are seeing it impact on our patients and on our communities, and scientists are very clear that we need to rapidly shift away from fossil fuels and towards cleaner and healthier and safer forms of energy to protect human health. Okay, that was quite a short clip, um, so you may not have had time to write in the chat. Um, feel free to pop it in now or to just uh, use the raise hand function. If you were, if there was something you thought that Kate did to talk about um, climate change and health um, that appealed to you. Um, so Grace, clear message and simple language. This is absolutely essential. Uh, we don't want to get caught up in medical jargon. Um, we don't want to get, you know, use language that people don't understand actually really good to try and talk to someone as if they were you know a 12 year old um that's not to uh, that's not to be condescending but just really if we're talking about an area that other people don't have a lot of understanding of um they they're not necessarily going to under, understand what we're putting across so we want to talk about it in a really simple way um thank you to everyone who said that um mentioned the health emergency and then talked about how Emergency is not a word you use lightly. Now, this is really interesting because Kate is a doctor um, and people are not used to doctors using a word like emergency. Um, they're not someone that um, would typically maybe refer to, you know, climate change as an emergency in the minds of the average person. Um, so it's really powerful. So I, I do say later um, not to use um, divisive language. Um, I guess Kate is an example of using it really well sparingly, but a lot of people can be turned off by this message um, if they are sceptical. Um, I think in Kate's case, it works really well because she talks about that this is not a term that she uses lightly. Um, she says simply what we need to do and why, Tanya. Yep, that's it. Like really clearly points out um, a picture um, clear, direct, repeated message, uh, exactly. This is about how she repeats the same message over and over and creates that link um, in our head, but in our eight golden rules for talking about climate change and health. So I'm going to go through them now um, and you'll get a chance to apply these. So our eight golden rules. Simple messages repeated often by trusted voices are most effective. Um, I've said that uh, three or four times now, and it's almost like this is the simple message repeated often that I'm trying to get through to you. Uh, so hopefully that is building up some of those um, neuron pathways. We want to pick a simple message that we can have as a mantra in our work. Um, for many of you, maybe as health promotion practitioners, it might be climate action is good for our health. Um, that can be something that we say over and over again when, when um, if, if that question is directed at us. Um, 
we would say more than that because in our roles, we're not talking to the media, we're talking to people and we want to have a genuine conversation. But this is a mantra that we can put into our work over and over and um, really build that message up in people's head. Uh, you will feel repetitive. I feel repetitive saying this like three or four times already in this conversation, but uh, it's not about you, how you feel. And if you feel like you're being repetitive, it's about them getting the message. And, and you really do have to say it multiple times. Um, number two, let's frame the issue as a health problem. Most people have come to climate change, have learned about it maybe through an inconvenient truth or um, you know, young people have really grown up with it and, and always known of it as something that exists. Um, or they've come to it through the realm of politics. We, climate change is one of those wicked problems that covers every aspect of our lives. It's also an economic problem. It's also a social justice problem. Um, but we, we're health professionals here or we work in the health sector. And so the most powerful way for us to talk about climate change is as a health problem. Um, so we're trying to move people away from seeing it as an environmental problem or a political problem. Um, one of the best reasons to do this is that health is a universal value. People are ta taught to value their health from the time they're very young and to value the health of their families and their friends and their communities, even when we're kids. Um, that's one of the things that we're taught from a really young age from our, from our, um, from our society and, you know, hopefully our family and friends as well. So um, this goes into our next point, which is speaking to your audience's values. Um, I think as health promotion and public health people, many of you will be familiar with this concept, but speaking to someone's values is about finding out what's important to them and creating a connection between you and that person um, based on what's important to them. So it could be um, they love... Um, you know, they love to play sport and they love to focus on their fitness. They could be really interested in their local ecosystem. They might be, you know, parents. Uh, every parent is worried about the health of their kids. Um, they could be a really, uh, you know, patriotic citizen who is just so proud of um, taking care of the health of their community. Whatever it is, um, we can have that in our mind and, and talk about climate change and the health impacts in a way that taps into those, those things that they care about. So we're already, we've already got a head start. Health is a universal value. People value their health. And for certain people, there may be something that we can tap into it, whether it's their kids' health, whether it's their community's health, whether it's their own personal fitness. Um, yeah, so knowing your audience is important. Um, and then we want to, something else we can do is introduce the health co-benefits of action. Um, climate action is good for our health. Um, I'm going to go through six ways that climate action is good, good for our health a bit later. Um, but this is something that is solutions focused, is positive, and people like to hear this message um, rather than the doom and gloom of climate change, which is exactly what they hear when it's framed as a political problem and as an environmental problem. That is a doom and gloom frame. Health um, can be a much more positive frame and much more solutions focused. Um, extreme weather is a good opportunity to educate people. Um, as Australians, I'm sure that every person here has heard a politician after a extreme weather event say now is not the time to talk about climate change wrong wrong 100 wrong it is the time to talk about climate change um, because it's it's what's happening and people are paying attention because it's something that they can see is having an effect on their lives um, and we owe it to them to give them Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. I do apologise if I dropped out a bit there. Um, I, I was just during an extreme weather event. Um, people deserve honest information at these. Um, 
I do apologize. Um, can you hear me now? Can I get a thumbs up? Okay, great. I do apologize. How embarrassing. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm sharing my screen. Screen two. I'm not sure <laughs> where I left off. Um, did we hear me wax lyrical about talking about climate change during extreme weather? Great. Thank you so much to Jenny and Heather, who are the people who I can see while I'm sharing my screen, and they very helpfully always give me a thumbs up and a thumbs down when I ask. Um, very helpful. Great. Okay. Um, back at it. Um, so avoiding polarizing language like crisis. Um, you did hear me before say that um, Kate Charleston, uh, Charlesworth does a great job when she talks about it being a public health emergency. Something to be um, mindful of is that uh, she is in the media. Um, she's trying to make a splash. She's trying to get a, a, a snippet that's going to be shown on the nightly news, which she achieved, obviously. Um, in our day-to-day -day conversations, um, your expertise as a health professional is, is partially given its power for being seen as a um, an, an unbiased um, source of information without an agenda when it comes to climate change. Um, words like crisis or emergency can um, evoke fear in some people. Um, it can also promote scepticism in some people, and it means that anyone who feels fearful, who feels fearful from this um, approach or who, um, who doesn't believe that it is a crisis is likely to get turned off um, and not listen to your message, which is very important. So we don't want that. And the last two really tie in together, um, staying in your area of expertise. No one, well, some people might expect that if you're bringing up climate change that you have uh, the full knowledge of a climate scientist and that you should have absorbed the full contents of the IPCC report. That is not your role. Um, you don't have to feel like you need to answer every question on climate science um, and to convince people that the climate science is real. The climate science is settled. The scientists believe in that. And now your role is to stay in your area of, of expertise and talk about what you can be confident that you know about. If people in um, a setting ask you questions that um, are not to do with your expertise, you don't have to answer that question. You can always bring it back to your expertise. Here's what I know as a health professional. Here's why it is a health problem. Um, here's why climate action is good for health. Um, if you do come across someone who is a denier, um, feel free to abort mission. Um, you don't need to give yourself a headache. Um, if they're like climate change is absolutely and categorically not true, it's really not worth your time or theirs, frankly, uh, to, to try and convince them otherwise. It's not your role. And, and remember that people who do think that way, they actually represent a really, really small amount of people um, allowed percent of you know a loud subsection of people but a small percent of people and if we don't convince them it's no big deal because the vast majority of people uh, don't think about climate change that way um we are uh, i'm going to talk really quickly about uh where we can do this work and and um the health pro benefits um, and then i'm going to pass it over to you guys to get into pairs and um role play some of this um don't leave it's useful i promise um so where can we talk about climate change uh during interactions with patients or clients or community members whoever it is that you work with um but there's other ways that we can do it in our waiting room do we need brochures that talk about it posters um in your workplace with your colleagues health uh health care settings are responsible for seven percent of australia's emissions um which is huge. So we can clean up our own act in our workplaces and, and reduce our own emissions and become more sustainable and make a change that way. Um, you can talk about it online. So if you have a website or um, if you've got, um, you know, active professional social media accounts, there's plenty you can do in this space to um, raise your voice and your voice will have an impact in these spaces. Um, because of um, your reliability and trustworthiness as a messenger, you can talk to the media. Um, that might be really outside the remit of what you feel comfortable doing. But if it is something you feel comfortable doing, even if it's talk back or even if it's letters to the editor, that's something we can help you with. Um, 
to your elected representative, our MPs and senators hear from us way less than you think they would. And um, I had a health promotion practitioner um, with her MP the other day, Josh Burns, and they had an amazing, amazingly productive conversation about climate and health because as a health promotion practitioner working for local government, she has to consider the impacts of climate change in every decision she makes, right? That's, she's legally required to do that. And she put it to Josh, why, why, don't, why doesn't that happen at the federal level? It's crazy that I, um, it, as, a, as a one employee in a local council has to do this work and that our federal MPs um, on six figures a year aren't required to do that. And, it, and that point really got across. So um, health is a really powerful way to talk to decision makers about climate change. Um, and I'm going to go quickly through some health co-benefits of climate action. So, um, and hopefully this, you know, makes you think of people that you work with and how you might be able to bring up some of these topics um, so cycling and walking, you know, improves our heart and lung health, um, reduces the risk of, of many diseases, and it also reduces the pollution from cars, which we know um, is a, a big problem for people uh, with respiratory illnesses um, and, and more. Um, eating less meat. Um, meat is a very carbon intensive food source. And it, it, if you eat less of it and eat more veggies, um, lowers the likelihood of bowel cancer, heart disease, obesity. This is not comprehensive, by the way, this list. There are many more co-benefits and also more benefits to these co-benefits I've listed. Um, spending time in nature, we know this is really good for um, improved mood, um, stress, um, and we can mimic this response by increasing our green space at home. Um, going gas free is a big one. People love their gas kitchens, but they're not aware that, um, for instance, gas fired cook cooktops are strongly linked with asthma in children. And a report that came out this year found that the likelihood of, a, of a, the effect of a gas cooktop in a household um, is the same as having a smoker in the household in terms of how it will affect, affect children's health. Um, so go electric and then um, buy renewable power if you can. Um, and also eating locally grown food, it's often more nutritious. Um, it produces less air pollution and less food waste. Um, so there's some of the things you can talk about, but everyone here has, uh, you know, quite different jobs and, and some things might be more um, relevant to your job than others. Um, and I'm just going to reiterate this point um, about curly questions, questions that lie outside your expertise. Uh, if people ask you something like this, um, or it could be more subtle than this, it could be, uh, you know, I can't afford, I can't, you know, I can't afford um, renewable energy. Like, why are you putting pressure on me to, you know, fix this problem? Um, I know, I'm not sure what it is, but um, you can, you maybe in your work, you can think of. Um, things that people might say that put you off talking about climate change because you're worried about the pushback that you get. Um, here's some ways to moving along again. Uh, professional is this this new resistance constantly is um politicians so um let's take their tips and use them again for good instead of evil um this is your opportunity um and your power to um you have unique power in this position to really get these messages across so let's give it a go um i'm going to break you into groups of there's actually fewer people here than i thought um, I did see a couple people leave. Maybe they're terrified of talking to people, but for everyone else, thank you for sticking around. I'm going to break you into groups of two, um, and I'm going to put the link to these um, slides in the chat. So open them so that you're able to check back on these questions once I um, split you out into breakout rooms. Um, and what I want you to do, because we all have very different work, what I'd like you to do is to, um, with your partner, introduce them to maybe a group or individual that you're working with. Um, and, you know, communicate to them what health outcomes for that person are you trying to manage or improve? 
um, and you might want to go into which determinants of health apply to their to their personal situation and whether you think this audience is open to hearing about climate action or um, should you stick to health only so some audiences um, are really interested in it particularly women with children um, younger people uh, the more well educated often the more open they are to hearing about it um, I'm not trying to or stereotypes. Um, this is just what the research says. Um, but there might be people that you think they're really not open to hearing about climate action, and I think I would put them off by doing that. But um, I can still talk to them about the health benefits of some of these, um, you know, some of these actions, and they might do it despite the fact they have no intention on taking climate action. And then if you could have a conversation with your partner, um, your partner can play that individual or group and you can talk to them about how you might um, get across um, a message of asking them to implement one or two of these co-benefits for their, for their personal health um, or how, you know, you might tackle a problem that comes to, comes to you. Um, and you'll have about seven minutes each to do that and then I will send a message asking you to swap. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and what I'll do is I'll jump into the groups and help with any questions that come along. So I'm gonna send you into breakout rooms now, but if you've got questions, come off mute and just ask me um, before you get banished to all of your breakout rooms. Um, they're coming. Okay, you're being sent into breakout rooms. Um, someone will have three people. Um, please just divide the time amongst yourself and I will be jumping into them to find out um, if I can help with anything. Um, if you've got questions, do jump off mute and ask me. Edgar, Natalie, Belinda, Liz, Rowena, um, are you guys having trouble accessing it? Yell out if you are.
I've just been muttering to myself, but I've been on mute the whole time. So that's embarrassing. Um, uh, Georgia, you're first up on my screen. Can you see my screen, my shared slides? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Just waiting. There's a few more people to come back. Us. Great. Um, right, let's get started. I jumped into a few different rooms um, and there was a lot of lively discussion going on, a lot about the new um, rules about including a climate lens uh, for health promotion practitioners um, in Victoria. Um, a lot of sort of sharing things that each of our own workplaces are doing, um, not necessarily a lot of um, doing a mock conversation, which is totally fine. I won't take it personally. Um, it can be a bit uncomfortable. Plus also, um, it just sounds like you guys are doing so much good work and I'm glad that you got an opportunity to share what th that good work is. Um, it'd be really great uh, who, who, had, who learned something new from their partner um, about a great initiative that they've got going on, something that you might want to bring into your work. Um, maybe use the hands up function um, or, or, you know, something you maybe you weren't sure how you were going to. In your work. Sorry, sorry. Um, every time I get a call, which I can't understand why people are calling me, it cuts out my hotspot. So it's extremely annoying and I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so hands up, who got some good advice from their partner about how to tackle something um, or, you know, learn something interesting that maybe another health promotion place is doing that you might be interested in taking back to your own work. Chris, do you want to come off mute and let us know? <laughs> Uh, we were talking a bit about the um, the local Indigenous community and um, we have a particular um, fellow, Lionel Lout, who knows a lot about um, Indigenous plants and apparently he's been talking with the local chefs about in introducing more Indigenous products um, into their um, cafes and, and restaurants. Awesome. That sounds awesome. Um, did anyone else have um, something similar? Maybe not uh, Indigenous products, but um, talking about locally grown food? Um, or is that something that people would be interested in taking back to their own workplace? Chris, I'm just going to lower your hand. Um, okay, I'm going to start to pick on you because I did jump in some of your conversations um, and I know that you were talking about interesting stuff. Tanya, what did what um, happened in your conversation that you'd like to share? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, we did talk a little bit about um, community gardens and um, growing food uh, for ch in children's settings and for sporting clubs. Um, but I just wanted to share, and I didn't even hear the end of it because my um, internet dropped out actually, uh, but Karina, <laughs> Karina from Kingston, sorry, Vic from Kingston. Sorry, Karina, Vic. Oh, got them confused. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Vic from Kingston was saying um, that uh, they were talking about sporting clubs and community settings, which are really hard to change and um, very, Although she was saying that they're open, they're very competitive. And I know that City Grad Geelong has really struggled in this space, but she said that they're so competitive with each other that if you give clubs a bit of kudos and that extra bit of publicity, that's a really good win. Um, because there, a lot of the time the clubs I've worked in that area uh, a little bit over the last sort of 10 or 12 years, and they like to make a lot of money out of their food. But if you give them a solution, like that extra bit of promotion. That's a really good calling card. I just thought that was interesting. Okay, I'm absolutely on board with promoting competition between natural enemies to for sustainability. Um, that's a great a great group to engage. Um, thank you for that, Tanya. 
Um, I know there was a few people discussing um, when it would be appropriate to bring up climate change. Oh, God, I'm frozen. Oh, no. I'm frozen on my own screen. I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you. Oh, they can hear me. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, who has some advice about when it might be appropriate to bring up climate change and maybe times when it's not? Or some insight? Or a question? I'm not sure, Gabrielle, if you're trying to clap or put your hands up, but um, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Sorry, it's probably my eyesight. Um, I had a great conversation with Rachel from South Coast PCP. Um, I certainly work in sporting group space and, uh, we're and she's been involved in them as well. You know, often there can be um, training when you're having some education sessions. We have some stuff around um, physical literacy, mental health, first aid uh, committee meetings you know you can talk about full, fueling your body with um, plant-based foods before games I've been um, a coach as well and having that conversation with the people that run the canteen as well so I think there's plenty of opportunities you've just got to pitch your angle and you know where sort of I'm in Latrobe Valley which is, um, but we, we, you know, people are willing to have that conversation. People feel as though in Latrobe Valley we're not, but we are, um, and it has come out of some surveys that people, you know, they just want that just, just transition for workers. So, you know, it's conversations can happen, um, but your approach is really important. That's a really um, great point, Gabrielle. Thank you for sharing. Um yeah, and, you know, the local context that you're having these conversations in is really, really important. And that's why as local health professionals, you have a way better sense of what's going to work than, you know, the head of a state standing up on TV or, or you know, me, um, someone who's based in Melbourne, talking to people. Um, as a local, you've got a really good idea about what is going to work in your local area and what's not. Jenny? Yeah, along similar lines, um, I met with Sally and we had some fantastic conversation about lots of things, but we also thought that um, the, it's the incidental conversations that you have rather than the, you know, maybe the formal education as such, which, you know, some sceptics perhaps may sit back and go, well, well, yeah, but I can't impact it. But if you have those little incidental Oh, great to hear you shop local. Did you also know that that impacts positively on climate change or, you know, those sorts of, of discussions where people might not even think that it's a climate change issue or anything else? Oh, great to hear you, you know, you went for a walk or you, you know, you bought some more plants for home, whatever it might be. And um, I think it's the little snippets that you have that might stick more so in people's minds than the you know, sometimes perhaps in a formal education setting um, or, you know, having to read reams of paper and resources and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's just as beneficial as, you know, the larger conversations, I guess. That's such a good point. I feel like that's like incidental positive reinforcement that um, makes people feel good, gives them a little boost of endorphins unexpectedly. And and there, the, the thing is that there is just so much information out there um, and people don't want to read, like people are busy and tired. Um, to give them um, information through sources where they're already paying attention is really, really important. And, and that is something as well. Um, in your role, people people are there to hear what you have to say and so you've got their attention. Um, so to slip that in incidentally, um, I think is, is a great idea. In terms of simple messages repeated often um, by trusted sources, another one I just wanted to share as well as climate action is good for your health is like um, walking, good for climate, good for health, or growing your own food good for climate, good for health. That's one we use all the time and it's just, um, it's something, that, a simple message that we repeat often that um, we find 
works just really simply. Um, so if you come up with, a, you know, a really cute little um, mantra that you want to slip into um, saying every so often, it really does um, create a theme for people who listen to you. Um, there's so much I heard in those conversations. I am going to have to move us on, but um, yeah, uh, you know, I hope that some of these conversations that you've had, you might take these back and have them within your own workforce with, with people in your team um, to see how you can um, implement some of these things at home. Um, I'm just going to introduce you quickly. This is our, our comms guide. We'll send this around afterwards. This has more tips. It has those eight golden rules written in there. It's got um, some simple messages that you can adapt for yourself to into your own work. Um, it's got information on how and where to talk about climate change um, at work. Um, and it's got sort of an update on sort of the most recent evidence as well. Um, I'm just going to run one last poll. Um, if we could finish this off quickly, and then I'll take you through some next steps that we um, that we can offer you to um, you know solidify this work if you're interested. Um, yeah, so these are all single choice, so just one per per question, and I will keep. Um, actually, I'll just wait. I was just getting excited. Great, we've got about half of you have answered those. Just waiting for the last six. Give you five seconds. There's just one last person. Okay, I'm going to end that. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. That really helps us guide um, how we might do future training sessions and, um, you know, get more funding for this kind of work. So um, I would keep your eye out for a follow-up email. I'm going to put a whole bunch of useful resources in there. Um, and these are things that you can also send around at work um, and say, you know, I went to this training and, and here's a resource we've been given. Is this something we can have a chat about implementing um, in our workforce? Um, and as well, um, as well as talking about climate change and, and, and health at work, um, also considering what can you do in your workplace to reduce your own footprint? Um, the healthcare sector does account for 7% of Australia's emissions. Um, it's much more tertiary healthcare settings, which um, not all of us are working in, but um, there's still plenty that we can do to make sure that we're delivering this message, but we're also um, walking the talk, so to speak. Um, and then what I'd really encourage you to do is to, you know, reach out to your PCPs, but also to the Climate and Health Alliance. Is there action you want to take out of this? Do you want more support to talk to your patients about it? Are you interested in talking to the media? Do you want to talk to your MP about climate and health and what you've learned? Um, there's plenty of ways that we can support you to do this. Um, oh, I've just realised my video is still off, which um, I guess is fine. Oh, it won't turn back on. I guess my um, internet is, is um, intervening, which I guess is useful. Um, <laughs> yeah, so do get in touch um, with us. We have a lot of ways that we can help you to do this work. Um, and I just want to follow, I just want to finish on this. This is my simple message repeated often um, that I come back to a lot. Um, climate change is a health emergency. As a health professional, your voice counts. So, getting across that uh, you know this is a this is a really serious situation that we're in. But um, as health professionals, we are part of the solution. Our voice does count. We have a powerful voice. In fact, a uniquely powerful voice. Um, and it is something that, with training and and with thought, we can use um, to address. Uh, the climate crisis. Um, sorry, that is me using a word that I said not to use, uh, <laughs> crisis, but um, I think I've got a, enough captive audience that I can get away with it. But uh, yeah, do get in touch with me if you're interested in more resources, more training, um, or, you know, something at your own workplace. Um, and thank you so much for coming in. And we will be making a recording of this available. Um, 
uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, I will send through a whole bunch of stuff and thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it and I hope it's been useful. Just gonna stop the recording.